Okay, people, how you doing there? Charles J. Basrap here with the official episode of Hashtag The Thing to discuss the ongoing crisis in the Middle East. Now, if you've been following me on Facebook, you see I just posted a live stream. I was trying to do this entire thing live, but the stream kept crapping out on us. So I just reposted a new live version of the preamble, if you will, so that you can see where this is going from. And now I am offline recording this, and I'll post it to that link over there on my Facebook page. And I'll probably put it out on Twitter, at CBaseRap. So... We're going to be talking about what's been going on in the Middle East. As I explained in the preamble real briefly is that this is going to be an excerpt with some commentary uh, from my book on, on the American at the Crossroads. I will show it to you again. This is it. This was published back in 2010. And this was the result of hundreds of books, and like I said, tens of thousands of pages of information that ranged from books. Uh, UN Security Council documents, everything that had been done on the Middle East from its inception to 2010, interviews, uh, newspaper articles, the charters and the founding documents of groups like Hamas and uh, the early Zionist papers, uh, going through all of that history because I wanted it to be in depth. I didn't want it to just be something just ad hoc tossed together. This is something that I, I feel really strongly about and there's a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of ways that are so easy to misunderstand it, especially when we're looking at it just through the images of what we see on the television and you know not understanding the context of it. Before I start, it just want, it reminds me of in 1993, the Battle of the Black Sea, which we know better as the uh, Black Hawk Down incident that was in, in the movies and in the, in the book by Bowden, was though part of the reason that Clinton pulled out of Somalia after that happened was because of the negative impact of what was going on on television. It was shown in a poll that was conducted by the Military Times that those who saw the footage of the United States helicopter pilot being his body being dragged to the streets of Mogadishu and chopped up and hit with uh, with machetes were far more likely to support pulling out of Somalia than those who hadn't seen it. So images can sometimes change things for better or for worse. And just looking at them out of context, we really need to be careful of doing that. You know, it's one of the reasons why Carter never made a second attempt to rescue the hostages in Iran, because the first attempt was marred by a helicopter accident that wound up uh, resulting in Iranian, you know, troops, you know, basically looking at the charred helicopter and poking, you know, U.S. servicemen's body and stuff like that, and it did not play well, especially so soon after, you know, being disentangled from the, you know, the conflicts that were over in Vietnam. So Carter never again made an attempt out of fear. That's what made it so astounding and so much, so courageous that President, you know, President Obama was willing to go in there and get uh, you know, Bin Laden because if that had happened, there's no if, if something like that had happened, there's no way public opinion would have been on his side. That could have gone very very wrong. So I'm asking people here. This is a long video, as I explained in the preamble, to please give this a chance. All right. This is a this is an historic, you know, text that I'm reading from. This is based on research. There is some, you know, like you no know, opinion here and there, but this is stuff that's happened. I will be adding some commentary as I go. I will be putting the citations in the uh, in the comments field so that people can look up the things that I'm talking about so they can see where certain quotes have come from. Um, I pull from all over the place. A lot of these in this particular section were from uh, from UN documents themselves. And as I also explained earlier, that this part of my book that I'm reading from was from early on and was basically leading up to the post-1979 Middle East. So this is not meant to be an exhaustive. You're not going to hear a lot of stuff about you know, the suicide bombings and the intifadas and things like that that have happened and the events that happened in the post-9-11 world. This is pretty much from the beginnings, from like you know, the 1920s and such, up until the 1979, you know, and that's it. Other stuff I'll do a topic, I'll do a video on later on, maybe, you know, we'll see. But this is just to give you at least a an historical background 
of the situation there to show that it's a lot more complex and that maybe this will help people better understand why just pointing it's all that person's side, it's all that person's side, why that's such a flawed way of thinking. So that said, thank you for joining me tonight for this episode of Hashtag The Thing on the Mideast Crisis, and here we go. Despite the tensions early on, outside of a few mostly isolated instances of violence perpetrated by both sides, the Arabs and Jews as a whole continue to live in relative harmony, not quite integrated, but coexisting in something of a you-stay-on-your-side-I'll-stay-on-my-side type mentality. However, a key event in 1929, what became known as the Wailing Wall Crisis, would forever change that. Now, the Wailing Wall, or Western Wall as it's more commonly known, is all that remains of the Second Temple of Ancient Israel, originally built around the year 500 BCE and destroyed by the Romans centuries later. Muslims believe that the Prophet Muhammad secured his horse at the ruins and ascended to heaven to be shown images from the angels of Allah, and it's seen as the third holiest site in all of Islam. Consequently, both Jews and Arabs claim an important historic and religious link to the site. Jewish worshippers at the site placed a screen to separate male and female patrons. But that move was seen as less than innocent by many of the Arabs in the area, who held it that it was against Islamic law for any sort of construction for any reason to take place at the wall, with some even suggesting that the Jews had done so in an act of deliberate disrespect and provocation. An instance that is so seemingly trivial in the grand scheme of things, it really became the spark which lit a very short fuse, and the result was a series of riots that were highlighted by wanton destruction and an indiscriminate violence towards bystanders, both Jewish and Arab. When the British finally managed to stop the chaos, quote, 133 Jews had been killed and 339 wounded, almost all by Arabs. Casualties on the Arab side included 116 killed and 232 wounded, most by British security forces, end quote. Though subsequent British studies came to the decision that the Arab violence was not premeditated, much to the chagrin of the Jews who were alleged that it was, the fact that the British so forcefully quelled the uprisings, it resonated in the minds of the Arabs and reinforced their beliefs that there was an Anglo-Zionist alliance pitted against them, despite the fact that the British had no choice but to intervene. The Welling Wall Crisis was only the first of many armed conflicts in the era of the British Mandate, as Zionists began to further cement their claims to the land, and the Arabs, frustrated by their own failures and by the contradictions of the British, they began to emulate the revolutionary actions of much of the surrounding region that was there. The events of 1929, however, proved also to be merely the precursor to the Arab revolts of the late 1930s, a series of revolts that would ultimately pave the way for the Jewish state. Now, after the Wailing Wall crisis came to an end, tension still existed. But outside of sporadic violence, in many cases unrelated specifically to the overall conflict itself, a semblance of relative stability existed for a short time. But as Adolf Hitler came to power in Germany, things started to change drastically for the Jews and the Arabs. As Hitler's Nazis began to systematically purge Germany of its Jewry, and, and you know, encouraging other nations around to do the same, the fleeing Jews were naturally drawn to Jewish enclaves in Palestine, which, in accordance to the 1917 Balfour Declaration, would one day be the foundation of the Jewish homeland, with tens of thousands of Jews even coming to the region by way of a, a devil's deal, essentially, as Zionist and Nazi representatives actually met together and negotiated Jewish emigration and deportation from Nazi Germany. The, the problem is, this influx of Jewish settlers meant an increase in food and water supplies being utilized, as well as additional land being bought, land that would have, in theory, been utilized one day for a Palestinian state. So the Arabs felt this was in violation of the terms of the Balfour Declaration stipulation that any Jewish immigration was not to be a detriment to the indigenous population. Despite Arab protestations, Jews continued to come into Palestine in heavy numbers, and the Arabs saw their land becoming the property of someone else. It seemed that something was going to have to give, and on April 15th, 1936, something did, when a group of Arabs killed a couple of Jewish settlers. In an act of reprisal, some settlers fought back a few days later, prompting an Arab call for a strike against the British and the Jewish Zionists. Now, the ferocity and the organization of the Arabs, such a stark contrast to the seemingly spontaneously uprisings of 1929, it caught the British off guard. And whereas they had been able to quell the unrest of 29 in a relatively short time, this series of revolts would last for a few years. 
as the Arabs attempted to join in the revolutionary spirit of surrounding Arab lands and forced the British to finally recognize their aspirations for statehood and curb what they saw as Jewish encroachment on their future homeland. Now, at this point in time, the Jewish military was still young and barely cohesive, but as an unintended consequence of the Arab hostilities, that soon changed as the Jews were now faced with guerrilla tactics and reprisals on their locations and learning how to deal with those. Now, while the real targets of the Arab anger were the British, the Jews often suffered as targets of convenience or opportunity in many areas. The British, unable to devote troops full-time to all areas of Palestine, were forced to arm small brigades of Jewish volunteers, only further reinforcing that myth of an everyone-against-us Arab mentality. Finally, after three years and thousands dead, mostly Arabs, the British government, after a failed solution in the 1937 Peel Commission report that called for a partitioning of Palestine, a road with the United Nations would later travel down, they issued forth the May 17, 1939 White Paper, which called for limits on Jewish immigration and the establishment of a Palestinian state within 10 years. This is back in 1939. So in theory, had everything been done by the letter, Palestine would have had a state in 1949. But here's what happened. Now this move was likely done for two key reasons, both related to events occurring simultaneously in Europe. For one, the British troops were preparing for a war with Germany that they knew was inevitable, and they didn't want to devote extensive resources to a protracted struggle with Palestinian guerrillas, especially since it involved a certain degree of babysitting, as the Jewish community was not yet strong enough to stand on its own militarily. Second, the push for an Arab state and seeming abandonment of the previously predominant pro-Zionist implications of the Balfour Declaration had less to do with any real British concern for Palestinians' wishes for independence, but rather had to do with the prospect that a discontent Arab population could potentially ally itself with Nazi Germany, thereby creating a military disaster on yet another front. As it was, neither party was actually enthralled with the 1939 White Paper, but the riots still ended. At their culmination, the Arab revolts can be seen as a series of failures and successes, ultimately. On the negative side, you know, for the, for the Arabs, statehood wasn't granted immediately, and they had to wait, and they suffered heavy losses. In addition, their insurrection had the unintended effect of mobilizing the more militant of the Zionist movement. However, on the positive side, they sustained a moral victory. They fought against superior forces and, in effect, caused the British to change their foreign policies in Palestine. This would embolden the Palestinians for many years to come and would serve as a lesson to terrorist groups soon to be emerging in the region, both inside and outside of Palestine. As much of the Western world plummeted into World War II, the situation in Palestine worsened. The Nazi purges against the Jews in Europe led to more Jewish immigrations, you know, in, which was in violation of the policy set forth in the 1939 White Paper. Additionally, the Arab revolts of the late 30s awakened a militant spirit in groups of Zionists as well as the more rebellious spirit in factions of the Arab populace. Making matters worse were the feelings of resentment that the white paper roused in parts of the Jewish community, as the document seemed a betrayal of the earlier, much more hopeful Balfour Declaration. Now, segments of both the Jews and Arabs were beginning to turn on the British. Seeing how a violent insurgency by the Arabs was able to influence Britain's policy in Palestine, militant groups of Jews began to engage in destructive acts of their own in an attempt to do the same. In addition to the Ergun, a militia that wished to establish a Jewish state at all costs, beginning in the 1940s, the Lehi, also known as the Stern Group, quote, also known as the Stern Group, employed terrorist tactics in the struggle against the British, end quote, to include bombings of British military installations and the assassinations of British soldiers, even going so far as to, quote, make an offer to Hitler to assist in the conquest of Palestine in exchange for the transfer of the Jews of Europe, end quote. That's interesting. They were willing to deal. That's how bad it was. They were willing to deal with Hitler just to get this land. You know, now, as both sides continue to exacerbate the tense situation on a regular basis, news of the atrocities of the Nazi orchestrated Holocaust, which in the end is estimated to have killed at least 6 million people, the vast majority of them being Jews, they had brought the plight of the Jewish people to the forefront of the world stage, pushing Palestinian calls for statehood to the proverbial back burner. No longer could Zionist claims of rampant anti Semitism and the need for a safe homeland be ignored as the cries of a paranoid people as they had been. In the gas chambers and crematoriums and concentration camps throughout Europe, the truth was far more horrible, far more inhuman than anyone could have conceived. It is therefore somewhat ironic, perhaps a taste of poetic justice, that Hitler and his drive to destroy the world's Jewry would in fact give the Zionists the greatest rallying symbol for their cause. You know, as the world turned its attention on the Jews and the question of the homeland in Palestine, U.S. President Truman continued to be quite vocal about his support for the Zionist cause and made certain that America supported the eventual November 1947 United States Resolution 181 too. 
calling for the partition of Palestine, as described earlier. While the world continued to throw in its support for the Zionists, the inevitability of a Jewish homeland in Palestine struck both Jews and Arabs, leading to further acts of violence, with Jewish groups conducting guerrilla attacks on British interests to force them to disengage from the region, such as the Ergen bombing of Jerusalem's King David Hotel, which killed nearly 100 innocent people and was at that time the deadliest terror attack ever seen to date, and Arab groups that were desperately seeking to derail any chances of Jewish success. As news hit the residents of Palestine of the successful passing of Resolution 181-2, the Arabs were in an uproar, as according to the decision, the total territory, quote, allocated to the Zionists comprised 56% of Palestine, despite the Jews only making up slightly over 30% of the whole, end quote, population of the land in question. As a result, from the weeks immediately following until May of 1948, chaos reigned supreme in Palestine, with both sides committing acts of atrocities against one another. And as the second week of May 1948 came to a close, just when the world thought the situation couldn't get worse, all-out war broke out. On May 14, 1948, under the leadership of David Ben-Gurion, a Zionist and brilliant military personality, Israel declared itself an independent nation, with recognition from the U.S. coming almost immediately afterwards. The long-awaited Jewish homeland in Palestine had been established, and a year earlier than it had been promised that the Palestinian homeland would be. Now, as for the Arabs, despite their presence on the land before the relatively recent coming of the Zionists and the contradictory promises of the British, a similar such achievement didn't manifest. It's interesting that Israel would come to be ruled primarily by former military leaders for much of its history, much like in neighboring Arab countries, the main difference being that they didn't come to power through a coup at the expense of the people, but rather reflected the wants and the needs of a nation whose populace feared their surrounding nations. On the same day that Israel celebrated both its birth and recognition, it also began its first war as armies led by Egypt and Syria, backed by Jordan, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and Lebanon, launched a major offensive to kill the infant nation in its crib. Much has been written about the eventual defeat of the Arab nations at the hands of such a small and fledgling state, and questions often arise concerning how one little nation was able to fend off the armies of six others. The truth of the matter is that the Israelis have been preparing for several months for what they saw as the inevitable reaction of the Arabs. To be certain, the Arab aggression in the wake of Israel's declaration of independence was more an ad hoc military blitz than a well-thought-out offensive strategy. The Israelis, having faced attacks of varying degrees on their positions since the Arab revolts of the previous decade, they had become more organized and had strengthened their army with sound strategies, and perhaps more importantly to all parties, albeit for different reasons, weaponry supplied by the West, especially the U.S., Simply put, the Arabs were outmaneuvered and outgunned. Now, ultimately, in a war that would last most of the remainder of the year, the Arabs were humiliated. The Israelis, for their part, almost intoxicated by their victory, began what became something of a pattern when they moved from merely defending their established state to pushing its boundaries further, despite stern rebukes from the United Nations Security Council. At one point, there came, quote, an ultimatum from the British government, unless Israeli forces withdrew from the Sinai, the British would be obliged to invoke the provisions of the Anglo-Egyptian Treaty of 1936, end quote, which would have set the Israeli army against the might of the British. You know, fighting a disorganized collection of Arab armies was one thing, but taking on one of the world's elite fighting forces was not something the Israelis were ready to do, and as such, they acquiesced. After the United Nations finally managed to broker a ceasefire, it delivered another crushing blow to the Palestinians. Quote, the 56% of Palestine that the UN had allotted to the Zionists, which was under Resolution 181-2, expanded to 78%, end quote the final 22% falling under the governance of Egypt and Jordan. The Arabs' decision to go to war with Israel could not have been more ill-fated, especially for the Palestinians. Aside from the loss of land and any realistic chance for statehood in the immediate future, the Palestinians also faced another pressing problem, one that still stands today as a prime cause of Arab hostility towards Israel, the right of return for Palestinian refugees. As adamant as Israel would be in future peace negotiations about maintaining certain swaths of land deemed integral to Jewish identity, the Palestinians would be just as vociferous in, per in pushing for repatriation for the several hundred thousand Palestinians who were uprooted as a result of the establishment of Israel and the subsequent hostilities. The, number, the actual number of the refugees varies, but some estimates place it as high as 500,000. Even more than the number, the reasons for the refugee situation are almost as varied. Many on the Israeli side contend that the Arabs fled on their own. 
while Arabs contend that they were forced out by Israeli terrorism, citing incidents such as the horrors at Deir Yassin, in which, quote, forces of the Ergun and Stern group entered the village and massacred 254 defenseless civilians, including about 100 women and children, end quote, before the war had even begun, an event that the Israeli government itself has acknowledged as factual and also inexcusable. So again, let's go back to that. That's something that that's not propaganda from Hamas. That's not something that was, you know, by some anti, you know, Jewish group. That's something that the Israeli government acknowledged that that was something that was done. That was something that was wrong. All right. So we can see already both sides have not been playing by the rules this entire time and playing innocent. Now, the reasons for the exodus of the Palestinians are more than likely a combination of both versions. While it's certainly true that radical elements of the Israeli military, such as the Ergun, conducted terrorist raids of Palestinian villages and forced scores of Palestinians from the land by way of intimidation, it is also true that many Palestinians fled when their villages came under attack in legitimate acts of self-defense by Israeli forces that had been attacked from the positions in the first place. However, that raises a question on the topic of counterattacks as to what constitutes a gross disproportion of action. No matter how one looks at it, a great amount of Palestinians were displaced from their homes in 1948, an issue that much of the international community, despite its sympathies for Israel's position as the target of the Arabs' ire in the war, also saw as a great concern. Eventually, the United Nations passed a judgment on the matter in the form of Resolution 194.3 recognizing that the Arab nations would likely forego any peace talks unless the situation was satisfactorily resolved. Even the United States, already the staunchest ally of the Israelis, urged Israel to cooperate with the world body, with President Truman sending, quote, Ben Gurion a note in which he expressed strong disappointment at Israel's continuing refusal to make any concessions on the refugee issue, end quote. Despite the pressure, Israel refused to make any solid deals on the matter, and to this day, the right of return for displaced Palestinians remains towards the top of the list of Arab grievances towards the Jewish state, and a call to arms for many terrorist groups who blame not only Israel, but the Western countries and the United Nations, who they feel fail to more forcefully demand adherence to Resolution 194.3, especially when they have taken action against Arab states for their failure to abide by United Nations resolutions. Now, I've said this before about the United Nations is one of the big problems with the Security Council in particular, when you have five member states that have a veto power and everybody else is for a resolution, all it takes is one of the five saying no and the entire thing is quashed. It kind of kills the idea of equality and everyone having a voice and democracy when you can have 14 member states say, no, this is a wrong action, and one state being like, nah, I don't think so. And if it's one of those five, that's it. You lose. You scored 14 runs to the other team's one and somehow still lost the game. That sort of thing in the Security Council really needs to be reworked. And we're going to see as this goes on just how much the way the Security Council is set up and the UN is established has been a failure time and again, not only with this particular crisis, but with many throughout the ages. But for now, for Israel's part, there were two somewhat valid reasons they had at the time for not allowing the refugees back into Palestine. Right? First, there was the fact that it was they who were attacked. The logical conclusion being that the Arabs allowed Israel to declare its independence and peace, well then there would have been no war, and therefore no refugee problem in the first place. Convincing argument. The counter offered by the Arabs is in their steadfast belief that the United Nations was not in any legal position to partition what they saw as their land, and as such, the state of Israel was therefore an illegal entity, squatting on what was rightfully theirs, more than they were originally allocated by Resolution 181-2, even if they did accept it, especially since promises were made to the Palestinians before the Zionist movement had ever really even gained the momentum there. The second reason also possesses some validity, but also presents a circular argument. After the War of 1948 ended, there was a ceasefire, but no formal truce, and the Arab nations were refusing to recognize Israel's existence and were openly hostile to its presence in their midst. Now, Israel's line of thinking was that in letting the Palestinians back into the land would be akin to letting a wolf into the henhouse. In other words, since the returning Palestinians would likely harbor ill will towards the Israelis, who they blamed for their plight in the first place, Israel would have no guarantee of safety since it would be surrounded by hostile nations and receiving a heavy population of hostile and potentially dangerous people within its own borders. As a result, they continued to maintain that until there was a legitimate truce and cessation of all hostilities, there could be no refugee return. 
The Arabs refused to negotiate such a thing until the refugees were able to return, so a stalemate that still exists in many regards today came into play. There would be no peace without repatriation, no repatriation without peace. At present, the right of return for refugees has not been granted, not entirely, and despite pleas from the international community, human rights groups, and numerous resolutions passed by the United Nations. And after their victory in 1948, the Israelis still essentially lived in a state of perpetual threat from hostile Arab neighbors, a very real threat that at times led to an almost heightened sense of protective paranoia, which fueled preemptive military operations born of fear as much as anything else. Cross-border reprisals became a common element of the Israeli strategy for defending their territory, a practice that's still present today. At many times, such reprisals were warranted, though the proportion of the counterattack and retaliation to the original attack was and still is often the subject of some debate, as Jewish settlers found themselves being shot at or even bombed from Arab positions. However, some incursions into Palestinian or Arab territories were predicated more on the nipping it in the bud strategy of dealing with a hostile nation, a strategy, a strategy that the United, the United States would later take on under the Bush doctrine of the post-9-11 world, like he did with Iraq. Israeli leadership had perhaps an understandable viewpoint of Israel as alone in a hostile land, and as a result often chose to go it alone route, despite frequent protestations from the international community. I say the viewpoint is understandable because the Jewish people had just had millions of their own slaughtered by the Nazis seemingly under the nose of the free world while no one seemed to care. So how then, in light of that fact, can one not understand the Israeli sentiment that in order to protect their right to live in peace, they may sometimes have to act as if no one's going to help them? However, while one can certainly sympathize with that mindset, the sufferings of the Jews that they had endured, that they continued to endure at that time, that doesn't automatically give them a military carte blanche to do as they see fit, regardless of the circumstances or consequences. On December 11, 1955, Israel unleashed a ferocious assault on, Syria, on Syrian positions, the Kinnereth Operation, claiming that the Syrians and Jordanians were attempting to divert the water supply away from the Israeli territory. However, Israeli Foreign Minister Moshe Sharat lamented that, quote, again, we see a bloodlust and a provocation to war. This operation was preceded by no killing of the Jews, end quote. So in other words, that was a completely preemptive strike on the nation of Israel's part. Now, even the United Nations, in no uncertain terms, condemned the operation in Security Council Resolution 111, which stated that the alleged actions of Syria, quote, in no way justified the Israeli action, and the attack of 11 December 1955 was a flagrant violation of the ceasefire provisions, end quote, that were set up after the 1948 war. While the intent of the Israelis was to show strength as a deterrent to any Arab forces that wished to attack, it merely perpetuated the cycle of violence we still see today, in which both sides engage in a constant back and forth, as reprisal leads to reprisal leads to reprisal. It's somewhat easy for outside observers to say, well, doesn't Israel learn that their harsh incursions do more to foster hatred than lead to peace? Or can't the Palestinians see that the majority of Israeli military operations are preceded by attacks from suicide bombers or rocket attacks, thereby oversimplifying the conflict? The truth is that both sides do in fact make their share of mistakes in dealing with one another, but it's often much more difficult to turn the other proverbial cheek when the first one is still raw and scarred and elements of each group openly profess the intent to stop at nothing short of the destruction of the other. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict can only truly be resolved by stronger actions from the international community and by a sort of self-awareness and acceptance of the wrongdoings of the parties themselves, that which is still a complete refusal to do in most circles. Now, the 1955 operation, it did little to dissuade violence against Israel, for in the Gaza Strip, the Muslim Brotherhood was starting to take root. Nor did the world leaders place themselves above all manners of preemptive strikes. In October of 1956, another war in Israel broke out, but to Israel's credit, it was perhaps less to blame than its sponsors, who for years tried to downplay their involvement. While the 1956 Suez Canal War has often been billed as mostly an Israeli-Egyptian conflict, the truth is that Nasser's Egypt, while not a supporter of Israel's existence, was actually targeted with the help of France and Britain, who wished to wrest control of the canal from Egypt's hands. The United Nations deemed that Israel was indeed the aggressor, but little was done to punish the country, mostly because France and Britain would have, you know, were kind of protecting them to protect their own butts. Now, Egypt was forced to retreat and was defeated, but Nasser's place in the Arab world, it would rise. 
This time, because unlike in 1948, the Arab powers were not beaten back solely by Israel, but by the threat of the Western powers as well. This event made Nasser a champion of the Arab cause and once again burned the image of a Western-Israeli alliance into the minds of the Arabs. The War of 1948 was truly the most defining moment of the Israeli-Arab relations, but the war in June of 1967 was a close second. Arab and Israeli tension was steadily building, and Palestinians, faced with the overwhelming superiority of the military forces and organization of Israel, not to mention wider international support, began to turn to other options. While the origins of the conflict are largely secular, there is no denying the often subtle religious aspects that were always present as the claims to the lands by both Jews and Arabs originated predominantly from their respective sacred texts. The 1950s had seen an increase in the activities of the Muslim Brotherhood, many members of which were forced to flee from Nasser's Egypt and took up residence in the Arab world. As they insinuated themselves among the disenfranchised Palestinian population, who had suffered numerous humiliations at the hands of Israel and the international community, the Brotherhood found a way to link the national aspirations of the Palestinians to its own Islamic goals. Establishing networks of a charitable nature, as it had done first in Egypt, the Brotherhood set itself up as the primary supporters of the Palestinian cause, and was able to garner recruits and fan the flames of anger that had been sparked some time ago. Gee, I wonder where we've seen that recently in America. It escapes me. One such individual would go on to one of the most important figures in the conflict, Yasser Arafat. In another example of the Egyptian prison system doing little to squelch revolutionary spirits, Arafat emerged, emerged from his incarceration in Egypt in 1954 for his associations with the Muslim Brotherhood, an unchanged man, hooking up with like-minded individuals in Kuwait to form the Fatah, which is Arabic for conquest, in 1959. Fatah was at first much like the Brotherhood in that it refrained initially from overt acts of violence, opting instead to engage in the dissemination of propaganda and establishing roots in the Arab world. Being a Palestinian who had served with the Egyptian forces in the assault on Israel in 1948, Arafat's main focus was the liberation of Palestine, and Fatah's 1964 constitution made it clear that the group's overriding goal was the, quote, complete liberation of Palestine and eradication of Zionist economic, political, military, and cultural existence, with armed revolution being the inevitable method, end quote, to achieving this end. It was shortly after that document that Farah began to launch attacks against Israel in order to, quote, unite the Palestinians, focus world attention on the Palestinian people, and to trigger a broader Arab-Israeli confrontation, end quote. And, in all honesty, it mostly succeeded in those regards. The Palestinians finally had an active voice of their own to fight for them. Indiscriminate attacks leading to Israeli reprisals made headlines worldwide, even in the United States, who had a major conflict of their own with Vietnam. And the tensions between the Israelis and the Arabs, they began to, to make both sides almost anxious for a final showdown. And indeed, a showdown did occur, though once again not with the results the Arabs were hoping for. In the months before June of 1967, Israel and its neighbors, especially Syria, engaged in frequent cross-border skirmishes. The Ba'athists in Syria had been funding Fatah operations against Israel by supplying weaponry and funds. Jordan, harboring many members of the Muslim Brotherhood and elements openly opposed to Israel, also became a target, with Egypt, still led by Nasser, an ever-present threat. This series of altercations eventually led Israel to believe that the forces were amassing near the border and they were going to strike, with intelligence reports allegedly fostering this belief. The actual start of what became known as the Six-Day War in 1967, June, was still a matter of deep contention. While the Arabs never explicitly denied that they had in fact deployed troops near the Israeli borders, their claim is that they were there as a preventative measure against Israeli incursions into their territories and were more a simple show of force than anything else. Israel maintains that they commenced operations on actionable intelligence that an attack on their sovereignty was imminent. In reality, it seems to be, as always, a combination of the two theories. There is absolutely no doubt that the neighboring Arab countries were engaged in subversive activities of varying degrees and that Israel was certainly provoked. However, no full-scale military, full military operations by the Arab forces had actually taken place prior to the onset of the war. In the days before the war, members of the Israeli government actually prepared a defense for the actions that they had already decided they would take, even drafting correspondence to American President Lyndon Johnson to, quote, claim that Egypt had started the war and that their guns had opened fire on Israeli settlements and that formations of Egyptian aircraft had been observed flying towards the border, end quote, none of which was entirely true. 
The United States had been trying to dissuade Israel from launching any preemptive strikes, but the Israeli leadership knew that President Johnson was in no real position to do much to stop him, with America embroiled in a war in Vietnam that was growing increasingly disastrous and unpopular for his presidency. With a plan already formulated and the Americans distracted by the problems of their own, on the morning of June 5, 1967, the Israeli Air Force launched a series of devastating attacks on airfields in Egyptian territory, destroying nearly the entire Egyptian Air Force. As most of the planes had been on, you know, they were just sitting there, their pilots having breakfast somewhere else. With that, perhaps the biggest threat to the Israelis was effectively crippled, and within six days, despite suffering some military setbacks of their own, the Israelis ended the war and forced the Arab forces to surrender, and in the process, secured an even larger part of Palestine for themselves, salt in the wounds of the routed Arabs. The contentious issues of the refugee crisis from 1948 was still present, but it was now compounded by a new refugee crisis, as well as Israel's annexation of additional territories, which effectively increased its size threefold. No longer were the Palestinians just living alongside a Jewish state that was on land they felt originally belonged to them, but now millions of them were living under an Israeli occupation. Additionally, from the American point of view, relations were damaged with both sides. The Israelis had angered the American administration with their unilateral actions, in addition to their bombing of the USS Liberty, an American ship operating in the area. Israel had adamantly apologized for the incident, claiming it was a case of mistaken identity, despite the vessel being clearly marked. The Johnson White House swept the you know, matter under the rug, and it wasn't until later that it even became a matter of public knowledge. As for the Arabs, once again, weaponry supplied by the United States, a practice that had increased in the early 60s under President John F. Kennedy, helped Israel defend its land, and so the myth of the alliance against the Arabs grew larger still, with some conspiracy theorists even claiming that it was American warplanes that decimated the Egyptian Air Force, perhaps to alleviate the humiliation of being defeated by a lone Jewish state. After all, it's more acceptable to lose a battle to one of the most prominent military forces in the world, as opposed to a solitary nation the size of Israel. But almost immediately after a ceasefire was implemented by the United Nations, a flurry of diplomatic missions met to address the worsening situation in the region. At first, the Israelis steadfastly refused to relinquish control of newly acquired territories of Sinai, the Golan Heights, and the West Bank, while the Arabs issued a statement of defiance commonly referred to as the Three No's. This quote, the Three No's were, no peace with Israel, no recognition of Israel, and no negotiations with it, end quote. Despite the increasingly hardline rhetoric from both sides, as well as a deep mutual distrust, negotiations were the most difficult that they had ever been. Finally, in November of 1967, the United Nations Security Council drafted Resolution 242, one of the most controversial documents pertaining to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that is still very much at the heart of the anger directed at Israel and the United States by the Arab world today. Resolution 242, adopted on November 22, 1967, quote, emphasized the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war and the need to work for a just and lasting peace in which every state in the area can live in security and called for the withdrawal of Israel armed forces from territories occupied in the recent conflict, end quote. Now, it's the word territories as opposed to the term the territories that is the crux of why Israel has to this day largely refused to implement and adhere to this resolution. As Peter Hahn, a historian, explains, such an ambiguity in wording, which was specifically chosen by the United States and Britain, served as, quote, a loophole that gave Israel legal footing to claim permanent retention of some of the land it had occupied, and also failed to specify whether Israeli withdrawal should precede or follow Arab recognition, end quote. In other words, the word territory can be interpreted, and in fact still is, as any of the land during the war. So that technically, Israel can only withdraw, they can withdraw from only a quarter of the land and still be in compliance with the ruling. However, the term the territories could only be viewed as the occupied land in its entirety, in which case Israel would have no choice but to return to its borders as they stood on June 5, 1967. It was a verbal sleight of hand that did not go unnoticed by both the Israelis, who were more or less satisfied with the terminology, and the Arabs, who saw it as yet another intentional siding of the international community with, with Israel. That one little word changed history. And on a somewhat lighter note here, this is you know, going off my book, but here where I am in the D.C. area, there was a case in Virginia a couple of years back where a driver was pulled over 
for not stopping when there was a school bus that had a stop sign out and he blew through the stop sign and was pulled over. He fought it in court and won, but why? He clearly did it. It's against the law. When he looked into the law books, it said that in any time, if, if a driver comes across you know, a bus with its, you know, its stop sign out and its flashing lights, it says that a driver has to stop a school bus. It didn't say stop at a school bus. The preposition at was actually missing from the official law. So he got off on a technicality by saying, the law says I have to stop a school bus whose lights are flashing. I can't stop the school bus. It's already stopped and I have no legal authority to stop it. So I, don't, I didn't do anything wrong. And you know what? He got off on a technicality and the law was amended to include that preposition. And that's something that could have ended more tragically, but it ended with, you know, just, you know, what it is. But just one word changed the course of history, really, by not putting in and saying the territories. Now, the additional fact, you know, I'm going back to my book now, the additional fact that there was no specificity in the terms of the necessary order of events needed to implement this resolution caused another problem. Israel refused to withdraw from any territories until a formal peace and full recognition was accomplished. The Arabs wanted exactly the opposite. No chance at recognition until the Israelis relinquished the land, with the Egyptian foreign minister arguing that, quote, Israel should not be rewarded for its aggression and its, withdraw with and its withdrawal should consequentially be unconditional, end quote. The essential plan of the United Nations was to force an exchange of territory for peace and recognition, peace and recognition for territory. The problem was that neither side wanted to blink first. The Israelis were completely unwilling to give up the West Bank, in no small part due to the prominent you know, messianic feelings of the nation and its religious connections to the lands being intensified at a time when it seemed like their military success was somehow divinely ordained. But they were willing to part with most of the Golan Heights and even large parts of Sinai, which formed a larger buffer between you know, their main cities and the Egyptian border. But whenever they seemed ready to broker some sort of deal, the Arabs made additional demands, and vice versa. This, perhaps, is the worst tragedy in the history of the conflict. Most of the issues that could have led us to the, you know, that have led us to the terminal of today in the Middle East, and I'm, you know, remember, I'm writing this in 2010, so it's still, and it's still existing in 2021, and it still stands true. Most of the issues that led us to the turmoil of today could have been avoided if not for a mixture of fear, mistrust, and blinding national pride. The occupied territories, as they are still most commonly called, remain key components of the demands of terrorist groups such as Al-Qaeda and Hamas, especially as Israel, in direct defiance of the World Court, the United Nations, the Geneva Convention, and the proposed roadmap as presented by the United Nations, US, European Union, and Russia, continues to build settlements on the land, a lingering problem for American foreign policy in the region. Now again, I wrote this back in 2010, and since that time, some territory has been you know, re, you know, given back, but the continuation of the settlement building has increased. Netanyahu's done it, Sharon did it, Perez did it, it just, kept, it just keeps going, and that is, by every definition, illegal. It's been deemed illegal by every single court in the land. With the Six-Day War ending, and yet another, with yet another defeat for the Arabs, this one the most heartbreaking of all, the desperation and anger was beginning to manifest in more spectacular forms of terrorism, the type of which the world could not ignore because the attacks would no longer be isolated to one region. The Jihad was about to go, go global. Two years prior to the war, the military ring of Fatah, Ali Safa, had begun to carry out attacks on Israel, though they had limited success. That began to change in 1967 as the Muslim Brotherhood expanded its network in the Gaza Strip. In 1967, when the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO, which was formed in 1964 with some help from Egyptian President Nasser, was, for all intents and purposes, brought mostly under the control of Arafat's Fatah. The Fatah attack from Jordanian territory on an Israeli school bus in March 1968 led the Israelis to launch the Karama operation, in which they faced off against the elements of Fatah and the Jordanian military. Failing to anticipate the amount of resistance they encountered, the IDF suffered a series of setbacks before turning back the combined Arab forces. Though from a casualty standpoint, the battle at Karama could hardly be seen as a victory for the Arabs, their ability to hold their own, even momentarily against the Israelis, became the stuff of legend, and, perhaps most importantly, brought Yasser Arafat to the forefront of the Arab cause. Arafat was now seen as a leader, which is what led to Fatah's eventual takeover of the PLO. Fatah itself also benefited in terms of recruitment as, quote, prior to the battle, Fatah had some 2,000 men under arms. 
by August 1970, it had swelled to 10,000 fighters, end quote. With Arafat's elevation to the virtual celebrity status and Fatah's sway over the whole of the PLO, the world was soon to be forced to acknowledge the Palestinian cause. Shortly after the Battle of Karma, Palestinian militants hijacked an El Al jet to Algiers. Car bombings, hijackings, and assassinations became the hallmarks of the Palestinian resistance to the Israeli occupation, especially as Arafat assumed chairmanship of the PLO in 1969. Perhaps one of the most audacious acts of terrorism ever, however, occurred in Munich on September 5, 1972, when a faction of Fatah known as Black September assassinated nearly a dozen Israeli athletes that were in Germany to compete in the Munich Olympics. The act of terror was one of the most prominent attacks yet by Palestinian terrorists and gave global attention to their cause, and the fact that it was solely against unarmed civilians made it even more notable. The additional effect that it happened so far outside the confines of the Middle East showed that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict was truly reaching a global status. As terrorism became, became a common expression of the Palestinian struggle, the Israeli military forces were no longer the only viable targets, as seen in the 1972 massacre, and such new tactics were, quote, partly due to the Palestinian military failure and the inability of insurgents to challenge the Israeli army itself, and were deliberate provocations that were intended to invite Israeli reprisals. Again, that's part of the strategy. That's why I said at the beginning, that's why I said in my introduction video, that's why I said earlier in this that, you know, just like you can't build on and, and annex territories illegally and be called innocent, you can't intentionally poke the bear and then get mad when the bear pokes back, especially when your plan was to try and get that reaction. They're, by their own admission, wanted to do this. Going back to the book, by stoking Israel's anger and in some cases causing them to overreact, the Palestinians became adept at garnering sympathy from the international community with claims of disproportionate punishment from the IDF and allegations that Israeli forces intentionally targeted civilian areas. And that's something we still see today. We've seen that this past week. The argument, while valid at times, is also somewhat obscured, and here's where I said you can't just look at pictures. It's also somewhat obscured by the fact that quite often terrorists would launch attacks from the midst of populated areas and intentionally place civilians in the line of retaliatory fire. And by the fact that the terrorists were frequently, they would, con they would conduct the, act the actions against Israeli civilian targets directly. Whereas, more often than not, the IDF would target a legitimate terrorist entity with civilian casualties being an unfortunate case of collateral damage for lack of a more tasteful term. There's no doubt that the loss of civilian life is always a terrible thing and should be avoided at all costs because you just don't want that. You know, whenever possible, don't do it. But there's a big difference between civilians being unintentionally killed and civilians being intentionally targeted, a distinction many people tend to forget when they focus solely on the what and neglect to look at the whys and hows. Both sides have done their share of inflicting horrible civilian casualties, and the restraint or lack thereof of certain militaries such as the IDF and even the United States should in fact be called into question at times, as should the terrorist attacks targeting civilian businesses and neighborhoods. When Israel is attacking a missile battery and it hits you know, some civilians, that's unfortunate. When they go bulldozing entire neighborhoods, that's not targeting a military, that's targeting civilians. There's a big difference in those two things, and there needs to be some sort of way that people can say, I can criticize the actions of the Israeli government and still believe that Israel has a right to exist. I can accept the plight of the Palestinian people, but still condemn rocket attacks into, into territories. It doesn't have to be one or the other. You can you can still have both. And that's I don't understand why people are so locked into these binary mindsets these days. But this remi it reminds me of a, a humorous anecdote from you know, the lead up to the invasion of Iraq in, in 2003, when a contingent of volunteer human shields very publicly went to the nation to defend it, and Saddam's forces started placing them at military installations and places like that, rather than the locations that they wanted. They wanted to go to hospitals and schools and stuff. That's where they were hoping to go. That is, places that were in no way, shape, or form on the plans to be intentionally targeted. So now those people were like, hey, cool, you're here to help here. Stand in front of this missile battery while we fire the Americans. You know, ultimately, the human shields left. When faced with the prospect of actually having to die for their cause in a much more realistic way, not just empty virtue signaling, they bounced. It happens. But again, back to the book, 
One would think that after three major wars and countless skirmishes in a span of less than 20 years in which land and lives were lost and the defeats became increasingly humiliating and the Arab nations that, you know, that, that they'd refrain from even considering another attack. However, contrary to conventional wisdom, October of 1973 added yet another chapter to the conflict, as Arab armies led by Egypt, this time with new president Anwar Sadat in charge, prepared a surprise offensive on the Jewish state. At this time throughout the Middle East, Revolution was the word on the streets. Pan-Arabists competed with Pan-Islamists for control of the masses in the violent, spectacular riots and terrorist attacks against Western targets and Arab governments deemed Western puppets were on the rise. While Egypt was still in a difficult place for the Muslim Brotherhood to operate openly, despite it being the original home, the Brotherhood linked up with the Palestinian cause and no longer was the Palestinian problem you no know, problem one for Arab nationalists alone. It was also increasingly being seen as an Islamic you know, situation for Islamic terrorist groups as part of the necessary struggle against the West, especially as Israel became more and more to be perceived as, quote, perceived as a Western outpost, end quote. With every gain that Israel made, particularly in regards to territorial acquisition and international recognition, it reinforced the old notions of the Crusades from centuries earlier in the minds of the Islamists. Armed with Western weapons and populated by non-Muslim infidels with a democratic system of government, Israel was an anomaly in the Middle East that had to be removed if Islamic rule was to be established in its relationship with the West, especially the United States. It made it seem even more that Israel was merely the beginning of an elaborate plan for the Middle East concocted by the West to slowly wipe out all Arabs and all of Islam. As Wahhabists and groups like the Muslim Brotherhood infiltrated the more the mission seemed to gain more steam. For his part, Sadat was carrying on in the pan-Arabic traditions of his predecessor, seeking to unite Arabs in battle one more time against Israel to take back the land lost in 1967. On October 6, 1973, the Jewish Feast of Yom Kippur, Egyptian and Syrian forces struck and started the war that would last only until the end of the month. The Israelis had gathered intelligence in the preceding weeks that an attack was being prepared. Unlike in 1967, this time, Israel waited for the Arabs to truly strike first, and then went on a quick counteroffensive. United States President Richard Nixon approved armed support for Israel, allocating over $2 billion to the Israelis for weapons and supplies. The Arab forces were ultimately defeated again, but had made some impressive gains and altogether put forth a better showing than their last misadventure in 1967. On October 22nd, the United Nations issued a ceasefire with Security Council Resolution 338, which Israel then violated by taking advantage of the lull in hostilities to gain strategic possessions near the Egyptian forces, prompting the Soviets to assist Sadat, which would no doubt have brought in true American military presidents and quite possibly led to World War III. Eventually, the Israeli and Egyptian forces retreated to their own territories. At the culmination of the war, Sadat was seen as a hero, and the war itself became something of a moral victory again for the Arabs. While they were unsuccessful in regaining the land lost in 1967, they were able to inflict heavy casualties against the army that had made such short work of them just six years prior. Israel's aura of invincibility was therefore tarnished, and America's unprecedented amount of supplies to the Israeli cause painted an even larger target on the Stars and Stripes. While the Yom Kippur War, or October War as it's known in Arab circles, was the last truly conventional Israeli-Arab war, many more unconventional battles would follow as the states began to remove themselves from the fray directly, preferring instead to engage in state-sponsored terrorism, and irregular forces became the primary foes of the Israeli people. The history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, as you say, is quite complicated, filled with secret plots, betrayals, misunderstandings, and most often a violent lack of compromise from all sides. People have often tried to oversimplify the conflict by placing the blame solely on one party, but the truth is nowhere that simple. The myth that the Jews and Arabs have hated one another for thousands of years is categorically false as the friction between the two peoples is largely a product of relatively recent Western meddling in Middle Eastern affairs. This is also an undeniable, there's also an undeniable religious aspect that lies beneath the surface of this predominantly secular cult now conflict. Both Jews and Arabs have a spiritual connection to Palestine, and in no small ways does the notion of the Holy Land, particularly with Jerusalem, play into the factors of why Western Christian nations like the United, Na like the United States have such seemingly unwavering support. According to Christian tradition, the second coming of Jesus Christ will be preceded by the rebuilding of the temple in the Holy Land, the site of the Wailing Wall Crisis in 1929. And as such, many prominent Christians have lobbied hard for Israel and see their return to the land as fulfillment of biblical prophecy, as do many of the Jews themselves. 
there is no doubt that the Jews have a right to a homeland that is safe and secure, nor is there any doubt that the Jewish people have endured terrible hardships in their history, especially with the Nazi Holocaust during World War II. That said, the Arab question begins with two simple words, why us? While it is somewhat romantic of a notion to have the Jews return to the place of their biblical ancestry, there seems to be something that many people forget. The land of their forefathers, quote, was not an empty land waiting only for the Jews to claim and possess it, end quote. Rather, it was populated by another group of people who also have an equal right to statehood, something that they still have not attained despite promises nearly a century old. I've often heard the argument that Palestinians should simply accept the fact that Israel exists and that the settlements in the occupied territories, despite their blatant illegality, are a way of life and that their anger is misplaced, that all they had to do was acknowledge Israel in 1948 instead of engaging in military action. This is often combined with the obligatory mention of the problems that the Jews had faced in Europe and Russia even before the Holocaust. However, I wonder if how those same people would feel if they renewed a lease for an apartment and they came home to find a family that had lost their house and the fire camped out in the living room. Would they be as willing to compromise? Does that justify terrorist attacks? Well, certainly not. But it does put things into a bit of perspective. The Palestinians, for their part, have been betrayed by their leadership many times and have missed chances for peace as a result. You know, I mentioned Anwar Sadat. He eventually did you know, in, participate in you know, the Camp David Accords, and he was assassinated for it. You know, He tried to sue for peace and was assassinated for it. Yitzhak Rabin, a British, you know, a, a, a Jewish, you know, leader was also killed by his own people for daring to have it. So it happens all over the place. But like I said, the Palestinians, for their part, have been, been betrayed by their leadership many times and missed the chance for peace. It didn't help that during the wars in which the Palestinian cause was utilized as a rallying cry, that the Arab government seemed to spend more time arguing amongst themselves about how best to handle the territory, rather than truly helping the Palestinians. Not to mention the fact that nearly every war conducted by the Arab forces resulted in more lands being lost by the Palestinian people, but no lands being lost from the Arab nations that were participating in the attacks. It seemed that every time Israel was willing to make a real series of concessions, leaders like Arafat would ask for something outlandish, or a Palestinian terror group would launch waves of attacks to derail the process. On the other hand, there were also numerous times when the Arab community presented fair compromises, only to have the Israeli government defy international law and resume settlement constructed in restricted areas, or launch search-and-destroy raids on suspected military hideouts. Israel's presence amongst a, you know, a vastly Arab and Muslim landscape is seen as a poison by Islamist groups. While many Arab nations have since established at least lukewarm relations with Israel in the years since the Yom Kippur War, non-state entities that came to emerge like Al-Qaeda, like ISIS, you know, and, and other groups, you know, they've sought to continue the policy of the three no's. And you know, the current ruling government of the Palestinians, the terror group known as Hamas, calls for the outright destruction of Israel in its very founding charter. So we cannot keep sitting here and saying that one side is innocent, that it's all this person, that all that side. You know, that ends the excerpt from my book, and I really, I know it was a lot of information to take in. There's a lot of stuff you may have to go back to, a lot of dates, a lot of facts and figures. But you see just how complicated this actually is how it's not something that can just be you know simply fixed how it's i know how both sides it's so seductive to say well you know i'm on the side of the oppressed people and obviously the palestinians don't deserve blah 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 but without acknowledging any of the things that they've done and the same thing on the, on the israeli side we've seen how many times just in this brief history that i've given how many times both sides violated laws provoked each other, did things that were wrong, that just continued the cycle. And that still happens today. In other parts of my book, I talk about you know the more modern aspects of the conflict, because my book is presented more or less chronologically, everything leading up to 9-11 and then delving into the post-9-11 world. But you see how these things just keep going. It's, it's the same thing now. Everything I just spoke about now, these attitudes, the way it is, the way the international community sees it, the tactics, the arguments, the reasoning, that's still as present in 2021 as it was in 1929. And that's a little bit scary that we're going on almost a hundred year, you know, the almost a hundred year anniversary of the Wailing Wall crisis and people still aren't putting it together. So we have to listen to all this. We have to look at all this and hold all of these sides accountable. You've heard me say it. I said it in my preamble. Accountability. 
people keep saying want to be held accountable, but then when you ask them to be accountable, it's like, oh, don't, I don't want to, I don't want to accept that. There's always a reason why my side, when it does it, it's okay. I'm going to make an excuse for it. Bull. That's not the way it works. All right. So that's the end of this episode of hashtag the thing. Uh, again. It's a lot more complex in the Middle East than many realize, and there's no easy solution, especially if both sides refuse to acknowledge their own sins and wrongdoings and continue to duck aforementioned accountability. If you've listened, thank you. I hope you learned something. I do. I know it wasn't easy. I know it wasn't short, but I appreciate you giving it the shot. Like I said before, you know, if I can reach just one, just one. If I reach just one, maybe this was worth it after all. But... You know, we'll see. You can follow me on Facebook. If you know, follow me on the rare chances I uh, post on Twitter at C Base Rap. This is Charles J Base Rap for the hashtag the thing. Signing off. Be well. <laughs>